So once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sergeant Denarius Mitchell. I am one of the Air Force and Space Force officer recruiters that's in charge of Southern Texas and Western Louisiana. Thank you for joining us tonight. And also with me, we have Major Clegg and Tech Sergeant Johnstone. And good evening, everyone. My name is Sergeant Johnstone. I'll be the other individual here with the slideshow today. Um, so I wanna talk a little quick about rules of engagement. So after the presentation, please, if you have any questions, wait until after the pre presentation to ask the question. Um, we're gonna try to make it as, as orderly as possible. If you can, if you would like, put down your questions in the chat box below, or you can click on the raise your hand little icon and we will call you uh, to present your question to Major Clegg. And one last point that I wanna make. So for individuals that have questions, please wait to be called on. Like I said, I wanna make this as orderly as possible. Um, be kind to the questions, be respective of other individuals having questions. And without further ado, Major Clegg, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm Major Katrina. Finn Clegg, I've got Finn's my call sign, that's what I go by at work. Uh, my plan here, I'm, I've been in the Air Force for 12 years, been an air barrel manager. I went into officer's training school after college, and then immediately, of course, to the schoolhouse. Spent most of my career, a little over six years, at uh, Tinker, flying on the AWACS. E3, you'll see that as one of the career options, and then went back to Tyndall and taught at the schoolhouse then as an instructor for almost four years. Also during that time was Hurricane Michael and then had to rebuild the school there and still working on the base and that aspect of it. I'm now in a staff position, um, but you'll see some of the different career options were here. My plan with the slides, these, these are actually uh, slides taken from two briefs that you would get as a new, a brand new student at Tyndall Air Force Base for the undergraduate air battle manager course. They take a few slides from the heritage portion of it and then primarily this brief that they do the air battle manager today. I only chose a few out of, out of all of them uh, just to give you an overview though. Of course, if you were a student there attending, you get a much more in-depth uh, brief with an instructor and talk more in depth about the career field and officership that you would do as an air battle manager. I just want to touch on some of them. So even some of the slides that may have more words, I'm just showing it as an intro to maybe like spark questions or see some of that overview of locations uh, for that you can see for the career field. So I'll go through these and maybe have some of my injects that from my experiences, but primarily I just wanted to go through these slides pretty quickly. So it would just uh, spur some of those questions and then leave time uh, for people to ask questions afterward. And feel free also, not just maybe for the air battle manager career field, but officership in general, if you have questions or uh, as far as going in or officers training school that I could only speak to those experiences, but I'm happy to answer questions on any of those. So. If you wanna start, next slide. Oh. Of course, for people in the military know that this is unclassified since we're all at home uh, on Zoom, but it's standard to have this on here. And these are the things I go over. Uh, I wanna introduce you to the ABM core functions uh, just for a little bit more understanding of uh, the career field. And then some of the systems, uh, airborne and ground-based that you have the options to work in as an air battle manager. Uh, a few slides just to show that the heritage, that this is a longstanding career field back to uh, World War II. And then uh, assignment locations and some of the advantages of being in an aviation career. Slide. Okay, there we go. Yes, the ABM core functions. These you will learn in depth, of course, during uh, schooling as the undergraduate air battle manager course. But I'm, and so I'm just showing them here, not so that you could learn them, but uh, just a uh, overview of some of that. And just for an example, um, for say solve problems, this uh, function serves to resolve dynamic aviation and air tasking order executive problems. On a small scale, this problem solving efforts can help maintain shooter persistence in the battle space. But then on a large scale, uh, the same problem solving helps work 
supports that adaptive during the ATO, which is the air tasking order execution and ensures the operational plans are tactically executed in accordance with the commander's intent and guidance. So it's learning how to, during uh, all kinds of various skills, utilizing strategy, experience, and intimate knowledge of aircraft, munitions, uh, weapons, and surveillance. You use all those in order to uh, solve problems, make speedy decisions, and uh, bring order to the battle space. Uh, especially with the speed decisions, the C2 function improves that target phase of the kill chain. Slide. And here are the two airborne platforms of options you would have from leaving the schoolhouse. About three quarters of the way through the program at Tyndall, You'll have a call sign night, and during that same time, they also do your assignment pairing. So you have an opportunity to have a dream sheet on there, but it also goes by ranking of in your class. Uh, there's usually only maybe one assignment to go overseas. So that would either be the person that's top in the class, or if maybe they don't have that as an option, it could go to the next person. But primarily, as you'll see on a later slide, the majority of the career field will be in Oklahoma at Tinker Air Force Base. Now people leave and come back to that location, but that's uh, the majority of the career field uh, is at that base. And that would be the E3 Sentry that you see there, the AWACS, the Airborne Warning and Control System. And then another base uh, for flying would be the E8 Joint, uh, Joint Stars that is in Georgia. Slide. And then for ground-based C2 systems, we have CRCs, Control Reporting Centers. You'll see some of those locations on another slide, like Mountain Home, Hill. Um, I don't even know all of them. Some of them get much smaller. Those are the main bases. Also, Aviano in Italy. That has moved around a couple of times. It was in Germany at one time from Italy. Now it's back to Italy again. And then we also have air operations centers. We have one uh, here at Tyndall Air Force Base that uh, is responsible for all the air operations for Operation Noble Eagle, any kind of air sovereignty or air defense in the continental United States is all actually done at that headquarters here at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. But then we have other air operations centers around the world doing the same kind of thing uh, with in different COCOMs. This particular um, picture is actually from LUD in Qatar. And it's, so it's a KAOC there instead of uh, the Air Operations Center, but it gives you a picture of it. Our location here, you can, some people can be on that ops floor working, but then there's also other jobs in uh, STRAT, which is like Strategy Plans Division or CPD, Combat, Combat Plans Division, uh, different places where people are planning missions from much more further out would be the strategy until you get actually closer and closer to maybe operations that day or that strike package. Um, moving your way down. So a lot of different job opportunities in those locations. Those are a little bit further, not like a first uh, first career, it's something you would do like on a second or third tour, a captain and above. Slide. Oh, I forgot about the pictures on there. Slide. Then there's a couple one-off opportunities. Some people like, uh, Maybe to be a little bit more in the fight as an air battle manager, you're a little bit further away from it. We're not the fighter pilot out there in the front lines. Uh, some people though do want that. And as an opportunity from, so say you went to Tinker right after initial schooling, uh, after about a couple of years, you'd have the opportunity to apply for something like being a TACP if you wanted to be an air, an ALO or an air uh, liaison officer. I know a lot of people that have done this, they found it incredibly rewarding. They're just the kind of people that don't, you know, would want to work with the army and kind of be embedded with that, because you're gonna be embedded with either like a soft team or some kind of army unit, depending on the location that you go to. And then being that uh, primary advisor, basically being bringing air operations down to that, uh, whether it's close air support or what's ever needed on the ground, ground, bringing that air to the ground support. So very exciting, but only for certain individuals that uh, want to do that job. That's never a job that somebody would be forced into. Slide. 
There's a few slides. This is now going into the Air Battle Managed Heritage. Uh, I didn't know if I wanted to put them in here, but I just wanted to show a few. You guys, again, like I said before, would get much more uh, history of showing this, um, but I just wanted to include a few of these. Uh, plus there's lots of pictures and everybody likes to see pictures, but this is actually some of the earliest you go back to, they called it chain home radar and it was chain of putting all these radar starts set up. It was the first time that they had early warning detection of aircraft coming in uh, during in those areas in England and Germany and being able to intercept those German aircraft. This was the first time that was, it was, really changing the capability at a strategic level for people back looking at these aircraft, being able to see that. Nope, oh, that's fine. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and then here are some um, facts during the Gulf War. Of course, I was not flying during that time, but I will tell you during my training at uh, Tinker, a lot of our, uh, look, there's, uh, your initial portion of the training has a lot of uh, civilian instructors, but all of those instructors were previous active duty. And a lot of them would tell stories during that time during Gulf War, because they actually flew more hours and more sorties than anybody else has during uh, operations since then. It doesn't even compare to when we, I was flying, you know, back in like Operation Enduring Freedom and that was like in 2012, back when we were still in Afghanistan, at least for the AWACS, other people are still in Afghanistan. And then uh, in Iraq and Syria, they were doing 24 hours a day for like weeks on end over months. Uh, it's the most amount of sorties they've had for AWACS in that area. And as you can see, they also had Saudi uh, AWACS as backup on there, but doing surveillance, directing airstrikes, interdiction of the Iraqi airplanes, all of this on a crew of over 20 people uh, in the airspace 24 seven. Slide. After uh, September 11th, of course, all aircraft were grounded uh, for months at that time. And as it would be for most, uh, basically you can think of like the first people to show up on the thought. The government want, you know, AWACS to be there because it's the first, uh, it's an airborne, which means then the radar picture can extend out to a much further distance than any ground-based radars we have across the country that uh, either the military is using or the FAA is using. So uh, AWACS uh, out of Tinker was one of the first to become airborne in that airspace and, and respond and maintain, maintain security around those areas and be able to push that air picture down to anywhere else, whether that's in DC and Langley and all those uh, air operations centers on the ground. Slide. There's a couple other smaller things. Uh, counter dog operations isn't something we're always participate in, but it has been uh, kind of ebbs and flows over time, depending on what's going on. Uh, but they do, we do participate in this. Uh, Curacao is up there. That was actually a deployment location. I know I think a deployment location, but since some people actually go there for vacation, uh, but it was, uh, it's a small island, uh, the North of South America. I and hear it's beautiful you know, all year round. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard good things. I actually never went on the deployment, but I have some best friends when I was at Tinker. They went on that for several months and that was all part of that counter drug. I know there is still some, not as a deployment, but flying uh, on the West Coast along California. Uh, I haven't been there in a few years, so I don't know exactly how they're doing it, but it has changed over time. It's just one other possible mission set that they can participate in and communicate with boats on the ground. Uh, just to help facilitate that slide. And then humanitarian relief operations, probably something maybe people don't realize as much, uh, but it can help in. And during hurricanes Katrina and Rita, uh, as you can see, there are 30 sorties and asking 276 flying hours. So assisting in air traffic uh, control of all the aircraft there, you can imagine all the different people in the airspace and needing somebody uh, to be able to kind of regulate all of that around. Normally, it's not a normal, like at a airport where you would have FAA or air traffic controllers doing it. They needed somebody with more tactical experience, which are the controllers on an E3 has that kind of experience where maybe uh, these military aircraft also need refueling. And uh, so there's refuelers need to be out there, helicopters, lower aircraft, higher aircraft, surveillance aircraft, uh, being able to manage all that in a battle space 
So here, not necessarily what you'd think of as a war battle space, but being able to facilitate those relief efforts. Slide. I think that's the last for some of the heritage. Uh, now there's some slides on basically assignment locations, kind of all the different spots across the country, and then just a few more descriptions of the job on there. Uh, the non-testable is carried over from the student slides. So definitely no test at the end here. Slide. Click another one. You'll see here, uh, this is just breaking out those uh, percentages of assignments around. So you can see predominantly uh, in CONUS and then a little bit in Europe and PACAF, PACAF being primarily over there at Kadena in Japan and then a base in Elmendorf in Alaska. Slide. There's a little bit more breakdown here. Now, this is exactly what I was talking about where Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City just outside of there uh, is the preponderance of their air battle managers in the Air Force. So each one of those other locations having less than 20 people, uh, several of them maybe smaller, some of them being more places like Alaska and Kadena, those do have uh, a bit more on there because it's several squadrons of air battle managers on there. But even some of the smaller locations, again, you're talking about, so maybe you're at Tinker, go to a location, come back to Tinker, that kind of is the option. So you're, you're never gonna spend your entire career at Tinker though, because for the, in order to build for the officership and the different opportunities, it's actually, it's required that you have some kind of rotation on there. It's not like a set necessarily every three years, but that's kind of, the mostly about every few years for officers anyway, up until command level, slide. And then this actually shows uh, within all those locations, but again, uh, don't get too excited about all these different opportunities and places I could be as an air battle manager. There really aren't as many, uh, but it does show all the possibilities, even though a lot of these uh, may just have like one or two people at those, but it still shows a lot of opportunities for later on in your career, if that's something you want to do. Each one of those locations are going to have different types of mission sets. Some of them are more of a staff, some of them are a CRC. You just kind of learn over time what your, what your flavor or maybe like specialty or wanting to do a different specialty over your career to kind of build a well-rounded air battle manager. Slide. And then this shows for the overseas locations. Lots more of them, but very few. Aviano has a bit more since that's an entire squadron. The Guiling Kirshen is a joint base that's actually NATO. So they're NATO E3s uh, that you fly on. So you're flying with uh, lots of other people from different countries on there. Uh, so that has a bit more as opposed to the place like North Bay, for example, only has two, a couple people there uh, basically as a liaison with the Canadian officer. Same with Ielsen and um, more opportunities in Osan. Uh, they have a CRC there. Uh, Misawa, Yakota, that's a little bit uh, fewer people in Japan, but Kadena is much larger as far as opportunities. And you can actually go there straight out of the schoolhouse is Elmendorf and Kadena. All the other ones would be follow on locations after you've done your initial tour. That's fine. Then just for if people aren't aware that you're already probably looking at our graded career field, but just for those additional benefits that we have the same, it's all for all career fields, whether you're a pilot, navigator, or air battle manager, you have aviation incentive pay. And then for those interested on top of that, they also uh, during different times have aviation bonuses. So they had bonuses prior to me coming into the Air Force, like in 2009, back in, I think, I don't know if they ended in 2008 or nine or 10, I don't know. But um, whenever they do offer bonuses for that, they're, they're having them right now for all rated career fields, especially pilot, primarily, primarily pilots and air battle managers. But they're for further on in your career because the point is retention in the Air Force. They've already spent uh, potentially millions of dollars on you at this point. So they don't want you to get out on your initial commitment so they offer offer those aviation bonuses, but I can't guarantee those over time, but they, they do have them right now for people that have already served their initial commitment to get them to serve another commitment, which will basically bring you into retirement. Um, 
for ABMs right now, it's $25,000 a year over four to six years, I think maybe up to eight years, depending on how much you sign. So if that matters, it's just things to consider or things you may have as an opportunity in the future. Slide. And then slide. These are just some of those, all those different airborne opportunities and then ground-based opportunities, those things like CRCs versus an E3. This is just showing those. The orange on there is the fly. So that's whether you're flying on an E3 or flying on an E8 J stars. And then the CRCs, a low um, opportunities on there. This used to be more of a factor when you only got, you have to receive gate months and be a flyer during so much time in your career in order to get that uh, aviation incentive pay that I showed on the previous, that monthly pay that you get. But that's not as much, that's not a factor anymore. The rules and the AFIs have changed on it where now you receive, you accrue gate months towards your flying career, no matter whether you're on a ground base or an air base. So it's really opened it up where people have a lot more opportunities and you do not have to be concerned about, I can only be at a CRC for two years because I need to go back to flying and get those gate months. It's opened up the opportunity where whatever you prefer or like to go to, um, you could spend more time on that during your career. Slide. And just in case people don't know, of course, uh, she's actually retired now. It's showing us General uh, Lori Robinson as the NORAD and NORTHCOM commander on here, but retired recently, a little over a year ago. But it was the first uh, air battle manager to be a four-star general. Regularly came back to the schoolhouse and saw her quite a bit. She was previously the wing commander at Tinker Air Force Base just prior to me being there. And I just wanted to emphasize to everybody in case uh, people weren't sure about it or what the full career paths were for it. But since we've been uh, receive our wings at the schoolhouse, just like pilots, since that changed around the time I came in, it's actually back in like 2010 now. Uh, it put us really on the same career path then as any other rated position. So ABMs are in any leadership level position as just as pilots would be. There's no limitations or think that it's any different or have less opportunities for command or higher up levels, whether it's staff or wing commander. Uh, it's, it's no different from the pilots at the front of the aircraft versus uh, the air battle managers in the back seat of it. We're just one of three rated career fields. Slide. Actually, to be a part of that, in staff positions, especially when you get up to like a major level or lieutenant colonel level, uh, there's so much of a shortage for pilots also, just as there is for ABMs, but they can fill uh, an ABM in any fighter pilot position. So not necessarily like a tanker or heavies, but because we have that tactical experience and our uh, education that we've had in the background and kind of that battle space, the staff position that I'm currently in is a F-16 pilot spot. And so that's what we, we take those spots in a lot of places, whether that's ACC or at other headquarters. It's very common in the last few years. This is just a small snapshot of the undergraduate air battle manager training syllabus. And this is the training that they conduct at Tyndall Air Force Base. Now, the only change to this in the last year is actually the number of days has actually dropped significantly uh, down to about, I want to say like 138, uh, similar to the undergraduate uh, pilot training. They now call it optimized training, and that's Air Force's way to save money and get their training and churn the students out much faster because of these shortages that we have. So I, I will say I was still instructing there in the last half, uh, year and a half that they were implementing this. And uh, they've been able to do it with a lot of other smarter ways. All of the students have tablets. They can, everything has been turned into lectures that we do has now been turned into uh, videos and it's on their tablets. So it's not just optimized and cutting cutting training down to the days and expecting more in longer days. It actually is done a lot smarter, I think. And the students have had some really good feedback from it where they're learning in a much better way. So it's not that it's just harder. Um, and 
So some of those numbers are different, but as far as like basic military aviation and C2 fundamentals and that there's an air to surface section and then the air to air employment and the large force employment, all of those sections are still there. And if anybody is concerned, which I would get a lot of times from students on day one at Tyndall is that they don't have any background in aviation and I've never done anything in it. Maybe I have an uh, undergraduate degree in political science, but it's just something you're interested in. The programs are specifically designed for that on day one. So they go through, even though there are a lot of people that maybe I went to college for aviation science and I had a private pilot's license going in, I didn't feel like I had um, a real advantage over other classmates. Or if I did, it was maybe for like a couple of weeks. And then we're all on the same playing field because everybody learns all of that uh, basic military aviation and fundamentals in those first courses and really builds over the time that you're there. So don't be concerned if you haven't been flying or been in an aircraft before. So I think this is the last one slide. Perfect. So you can even take off the slides if you want. I don't have anything on there and I'll turn it back over to both of you, whether uh, you wanna go through the questions or open it up to people. So first off, thank you, ma'am, for that amazing presentation. Uh, now we're gonna open it up for a Q and A. Uh, like Sergeant Johnstone uh, stated, you have two options. You can click to raise your hand and me and Sergeant Johnstone will call on you, then you will unmute yourself or you can type your question in the box and then me and Sergeant Johnstone will read it to Major Clegg. So let's not be shy. We always hear people have no idea what to expect with air battle managers. Now you have someone with over 11 years of experience in that career field and as an officer. So let's ask those questions. Yes, uh, Jordan has a question. Please unmute yourself and state your question. Awesome, thank you. Uh, just a quick intro, I guess. Uh, my name is Staff Sergeant Jordan Tello uh, out of Herbert, Herbert Field. I'm a ComNav technician on gunships. Um, so I guess my question is specifically um, towards uh, Major, is what exactly is the role of an ABM in an overseas mission? Um, and uh, both roles as far as like a ground ABM and a flying ABM. Okay. Oh, Jordan, just down the street for me. Uh, yes. So I can, I cannot speak to the ground portion of it. Uh, I, other than people that I've spoken to in Aviano and been at Kingpin, which is the CRC overseas. When I will speak overseas, I can only speak to the deployment aspect of it. I have not worked at Kadena. So just a small snapshot though, of the deployments, if you're uh, like most people would go to uh, Tinker after your initial training there, and then you get appointed to an op squadron within, you'll probably have one TDY, maybe a larger exercise, flag level exercise, and that with your crew specifically as a spin-up event to go to deploy. So you'll probably deploy within your first year. I believe they're only about four months now. Uh, I used to do them in six months. So it's not that bad, but uh, the last time I went, so no, we're not, no, no longer in Afghanistan, it was primarily in Iraq. In Syria, just a small snapshot then what you would do on an E3 crew in that area. You can imagine a lot of different aircrafts being in that airspace. So I like to describe it to some people as a fighter pilot uh, has their specialty and they are a master of their aircraft, but they only have a very narrow view of what they can see. And there's many, uh, many fighters pilots out there. And so if they have a strike package or need to hit a target, now they have an escort in front of them. Now we have the strike behind them. And when maybe prior to even going to a target in Syria, they all have to get gas. So now we have two different tanker orbits, maybe in one country, they're flying to another country with several aircraft. And then we have other aircraft, maybe even helos from the army flying at lower altitude. Somebody has to be in that airspace to battle manage that entire area. And that is what the E3 does. They can also be offset by other um, 
countries, we've had Australian E3s have that capability. And then in CRC that's stationed back where we take off, they can also do that, but they're more limited by their radars in certain areas. So having that airborne radar, then we can see in a much larger area. And we'd be able, be able to talk on the fighter pilots to be able to maximize their target location. Then also uh, there's several, you know, a half a dozen different air battle managers on the on the aircraft doing one person maybe just doing uh, the tanker control aspect of it. So if one person's controlling the fighters during that uh, to hit that target, now they're gonna hand them over to another controller to talk them on to for the air refueling and then hand them back over maybe to their airspace or whatever they reference kill boxes in some of those uh, areas in the country. So I was uh, previously an electronic combat officer, which is, um, there's just several different positions as you're in the back of the aircraft. And that uses the passive detection system on the E3, which can detect uh, SAM sites like surface to air missiles throughout the countries. So uh, on one of the flights I was at, uh, um, SA6 ring went active in a location in Syria. So I know immediately notify uh, over a certain radio on there, I can contact the pilot in that area to give them an intimate threat warning that that's activated, which means like the SAM site's radar is in an active mode that could actually like shoot off on there. So it's just one small snapshot of what you could do in that kind of location. And again, that's a deployed location. Uh, a place like Kadena runs a little bit more um, operations and does different types of exercises because they're in a pack F instead of like a CENTCOM location. So their mission set's slightly different. But as far as the roles and responsibilities within the aircraft, it doesn't drastically change, but there's a little bit different flavor, whether you're in Alaska or Katina uh, or in the desert deployed. I hope that answers your question, Jordan. Yeah, no, that, that does, that answers the question. I, I, another like quick, small thing, I guess, Absolutely. because, I'm, I'm like trying to like piece together like visually. So I'm assuming the AWACS is flying significantly higher than all of the other aircraft in the airspace. How much higher are you actually flying? Or is that not, not safe to assume that you guys are flying much higher? Uh, I mean, you don't only, I know, I, I'm just, you know, of course, it's my immediate pause, I'm sure uh, tech sergeants over here are laughing because you're like, oh, what's classified or not classified on there? Uh, <laughs> I get we don't, it. We don't, we, don't fly, have to... we don't fly super high. I'm not like a U2 up in like a stratosphere or something. Uh, you know, you can just think like more, you know, between 25,000, 35,000, you're just flying more like an airliner kind of is like their optimal. Um, tankers don't fly quite that high. Uh, fighters, it just depends on what they're doing. For their mission, whether they're like coming in, uh, they can be at much different altitudes depending on what they're doing. But again, all of that is deconflicted, and that's a big portion of mission planning. Got it. Awesome. Thank you. You're on mute, Sergeant Johnstone. Uh, yes, I know. Technology gets me all the time. So we do have a couple of questions that came through into the chat box. The first one. It's asking, what is the most challenging aspect of the ABM role? Oh, the most challenging. I will say, I think, I mean, this is kind of a, a plus or minus depending on whether you enjoy it or not. Uh, I, I will say one of the re main reasons why I chose uh, Air Battle Manager as a career field when I was a young recruit uh, looking, trying to go on a rated board. And I did not apply for anything else other than an ABM. And that was coming from somebody who had been in aviation and been a, a pilot at the time. But I just realized I didn't have, pilots have like a passion, like I have to fly, I can't do anything else. And I just didn't like, I didn't have that, but I really liked aviation as a career. So that's why I thought ABM was perfect. To me, it seemed much more varied. Uh, you have a lot of different roles and responsibilities, but at many times it can seem like um, maybe a pilot or other people in their career fields, you become an expert at something. And ABM is never an expert really at anything. We're like the jack of all trades out there for the rated career fields. But it also is why it makes us so beneficial at places like an air operations center and KX because uh, 
the F-15 pilot knows their airframe and their timeline, but the ABM knows the F-15 and the 16 and the 22 and the 35 and the tankers like the tactics and what they're doing and has all of those like fighter timelines and intercepts and capabilities of all those different things. So we have those little pieces of information of all of those. Uh, but I do know in my younger days of when I was a lieutenant and just learning how to be an air weapons officer, like simplistic control on the aircraft, it just seemed like, how am I supposed to know about all of these different things kind of, and you also learn about uh, what each one of those aircraft can carry and the difference between, you know, an AIM-120 and an AIM-9 and that kind of, so it just seems kind of daunting at the beginning to kind of learn about uh, my recommendation, which is what I did, because you know, I, I don't memorize everything and I'm not, uh, maybe the smartest person on there at that weapon system, or maybe it just takes longer for some people. I don't just memorize things as soon as I hear, it. I have to be involved with it and use it. And then I remember it. So I would just focus on one kind of specialty. And that's just what happens. You're always on a crew with other people. You are never doing anything by yourself. Even on a weapons team, you have you know four or five people. So you just learn how to maximize then each person's specialty. Somebody knows better you know, about this type or, somebody's better at controlling and somebody's better at the mission planning or the tactics or the info. And, and you just utilize all the people around you. I had never done anything uh, with team and that kind of team atmosphere ever as much as, you know, coming into the air force. And now, especially then being on an air crew, because as opposed to then some, you know, being the pointy nose fighter pilot, they don't have all those other people around me. And you have like a team of 20 people all the time uh, with different expertise and info, but you have to use that around you. But, but it can be challenging because it's like every couple of years, you maybe upgrade to another position on the jet. Now I got to learn more stuff and I get, I got to get eval yearly on this position. And you're doing that every couple of years. You know, I've been doing that for the last 12 years after being at Tinker. And I was like, oh yeah, I really know. And you really know the E3. I've been on here a lot. And then I PCS back to Tyndall to the schoolhouse. And now I have to get right back into really briefing fighter timelines and kind of doing things that I hadn't done in four or five years. And you kind of become an expert on that again. And it was overwhelming at first, but they have everything set up in place to teach the instructors, just like teaching the students. So uh, the military is very good at knowing how to and being masters at teaching somebody to do, to do something. Uh, so they'll, they'll teach you how to do it. But um, if you don't necessarily like things different like that all the time, but I have loved it. Uh, if you get bored easily or have changed jobs a lot, it, it is the perfect thing because you can always be looking for a different, uh, a different thing on there. Uh, there's a lot of options in the career. So for me, is it fair to say that an ABM is, well, when you're flying, is it, like a flying air traffic control kind of tower it's in itself? Cause you have to know where everything is. Uh, it is, but you'll be very offensive to the air battle managers <laughs> if you tell them air traffic controllers. Cause that's something that takes like a few months to teach people how to do, not like two and a half years or something. Um, the difference is, is because if an air traffic controller is just coming in and out of round, it's a very limited scope of- yes what you're doing in an air base, um, as opposed to really a battle management of an entire uh, airspace. Um, and now I mean. thinking of, of course, we don't do a lot of air to air engagements, but we do a lot of air to air training because you don't know when that's gonna happen in the future. So uh, for all the people, the non-military people, not the Jordans out there would have familiarity, but other people may be thinking of like a Top Gun movie where they're doing uh, the dog fight in there. But those are the controllers that are doing that entire engagement and making calls at different ranges, knowing when they can fire off a missile or when the enemy can see them and turn. All of those type of, that's what we refer to as like tactical control. So those are the aspects of why we need to know all these fighter timelines for each one of those platforms. But those are also the more exciting part of it. And when you're um, actively talking to the pilots during that type of air-to-air uh, uh, -air engagement, or sometimes like a large force exercise, uh, if people are you know familiar with like a red flag and you're controlling that whole airspace and there's a lot of things going on. Those are the fun times. <laughs> awesome. So let me transition over into a, another question that came through. It says, with most ABM slots being at Tinker, is it common to rotate back 
to the base multiple times throughout your career. And I believe you, you kind of covered that through the slide. Yes, it is. It, it very much depends on, uh, you, you have some control sometimes as options and, and where you're at, but as people learn being in the military, it's always the needs of the Air Force also at the time. So uh, in availability in different locations changes over time. Um, you may only go back there a couple of times because maybe on your after your second, you get chosen to go to school and residence, which of course is only like 10, 20% of you know, the top people of officers, but that's gonna change your trajectory and maybe then not take you back to Tinker, or maybe you really like it there and then wanna spend more time. I know people then have career, you know, families or other reasons why then they do wanna spend five or six years there. So it's very, it, it changes from person to person, but, but yes, it's, um, it's the most likely place. So you just wanna make people feel comfortable being like, but I had a very positive experience uh, there. Um, in the area and a lot of opportunities, a lot of TDYs there and different places to travel. So you're not just like stuck in Oklahoma. I went to red flag exercises and uh, a lot or um, at Nellis a few times a year. Those are sometimes like three weeks long. I've done the same thing up in Alaska and did those uh, controlling uh, F-22s and simulators and Marietta is a regular place to go. And there's some other spots like that. So a lot of TDY opportunities too. So you're not just stuck in Oklahoma City. Okay, the next question that came through, I'm not sure how much of this answer you would know, but what percentage of the ABM career field are enlisted? I don't know. Um, I, it's, I would say significant though. I mean, it's not like a small minority of people, um, but probably not like half or anything. Not like when uh, I remember being at like officers training school is pretty half and half between priorities, but there are a lot. And from my experience, they're not all previous, you know, flyer, like enlisted flyers either. People come from a lot of different career fields. Mm -hmm. I've even seen officers come from different career fields. So if for some, you know, some things don't work out and people do something that they uh, like, and then they're an intel officer for two years and then come over, or maybe you didn't make it and something else or come over. So, or for people that maybe still really want to be a pilot, uh, but didn't get that opportunity and selected for ABM, people do have those chances then after your initial training to still apply for those, especially in RPA positions. I know a lot of ABMs that have crossed over and become RPA pilots or have even crossed over and gone to traditional pilot training. And now is uh, one guy's an F-16 pilot. So th there's still opportunities if maybe you didn't get your, your first shot. Uh, it's not necessarily your last opportunity. Now, this is one of the questions that I receive on a regular basis, but if somebody were to go, were to be hired on for one specific, whatever it is in the, as an officer, if they wanted to transition or basically cross train into another field, do they have to complete their current contract or is there like a time period in between that they are eligible to transition over into let's say ABM? Uh, so if they're coming from a non-rated career field, uh, that would be much easier to go into a rated career field. So if anybody's just out there and they're like, you know, a finance officer or anything that's like non-rated and they're, maybe they didn't get selected for that and now want to do it and they now want to be a pilot or ABM. Uh, I know a lot of people that have done that. That's much easier than to come into a rated career field. If you are in a rated career field and trying to do something else though, uh, that's very rare and probably not going to happen. It can, sometimes they have to release you. I was at about seven years and I was trying to go to the FLET program, which is, uh, I had previously been accepted to law school when I came in the Air Force and I was trying to do that in the Air Force. It's a program where they pay you to go to school. So I uh, went through uh, all of the application process and all that kind of stuff. And I got a release letter that said that I could leave the career field and try for this opportunity, but it went to the commander and other things. So uh, there's, there's special things like that, that you can uh, try for. Uh, I didn't obviously do that. Mostly I had actually been an officer too long. So there's lots of opportunities that people don't know about when you're young, but the air force has lots of opportunities in there. Uh, Part of the reason, another little off topic, but I came in because I really liked going to school and I thought the idea of getting paid to go to school was awesome. So in a rated career field, uh, you spend a your first couple of years, you know, just studying and being in school, not like nothing against maintenance, but right out of officer's training school, a second lieutenant may be in charge of like 200 some people, you know, they're like, 
off the block running and, you know, being an officer, but anybody in a rated career field is just going to spend years in training. But I don't say that as a bad thing. You're, you're studying and learning. And, and that's why you get those other things of incentive pay or have those longer commitments because they invest so much money into you. But then there's opportunities later on uh, to do things like that too, to go to, you know, weapon school or some kind of specialty training or even, um, different doctorate programs and stuff. So they're, they're still, you're not completely limited just because you're a rated officer. Okay. Well, excellent. And let me get to the next question that's on here. This is by Ms. Bergquist. Uh, you referred to the undergrad program uh, in terms of whenever you were speaking on the aviation for pilots. Uh, does that mean that someone joining that as a civilian, as an officer will go through that? Or is there a different path for those who are joining as an officer with an undergrad degree? Second part question, what is personal life like? Average daily schedule and how often do deployments happen? Okay, uh, the first uh, portion as far as the undergraduate, that is just a term they use in the military. Of course, all officers uh, coming into the Air Force or any branch is already has an undergraduate degree. So whether you're coming from the Air Force Academy or officer's training school or the ROTC program, uh, whether you're coming from any of those, the first place you're going to go to as an ABM, first place you're going to go to is Tyndall Air Force Base. And they just call it undergraduate air battle manager training because uh, you're not, it's just your first step of training. They do the same thing for pilots training. That's just the word they use. So yes, everybody's already had an undergrad degree or maybe a master's degree. Actually, there's a lot of people that have come in. Um, that's it's just the term they use for your very initial training. Uh, then after that, you'll do something similar, but now it's more advanced because you've already received your wings from graduation from that program. And uh, now you have an actual AFSC of being an air battle manager, but you're not still not really qualified to do anything until you go to your next duty station. So now, whether you go to an EA or E3, now you have to get qualified to be on a fly, you know, on that platform. Now you're going to go through another academic course. Then you're going to spend another few months also then learning and flying on the aircraft and then do some training with an entire crew before you go to an ops squadron. So program at Tyndall used to be nine months. Now it's like six and a half months. Um, you may be there for a little bit. And then the program at uh, tinker would be like another nine or 10 months kind of with time in between there. And then also survival school, which I don't know if anybody has questions about that, but that's also then in between there for training for the second part, personal life. Um, I guess everybody's personal life is different, but, uh, I have, I got married just before I went to officer's training school and I'm happily still married, uh, 12 years later, which has been good. And my husband is not in the military which may seem rare for some, but actually in my ops squadron at the 960th, there was five other females, officer and enlisted that also had civilian husbands. So not really rare as much as in this day and age. And we survived many, many TDYs and deployments. And my last three or four years, I was at Tinker. I was gone about 500 some days. Uh, the deployments then were six months and then they went to four months. I know they're four months now. They were doing a one-to-one -one dwell. That's gotten a lot better now. They don't have nearly as many aircraft as they used to. And it's not nearly as much of a, uh, there's people just aren't gone there as much as used to be. I don't know if that's going to change in the next five years. I will say though, when I was first there and I was a young lieutenant, it was very exciting. And you want to go on those opportunities because it's the only time you're not training when you're just at Tinker and you're doing your sorties and your op sorties and your swim, you're training, you're training all year just for that, like one deployment. So even though you think like, Oh, I'm going to go on a four month deployment. It's actually like, it's the only time you get to utilize all of those skills and be with your crew. So mm -hmm. not necessarily like a bad thing, but yes, it takes stronger uh, relationships in order to do that. And it gets easier over time, but a lot of communication and making sure whether you're married or have a significant other, they're kind of also committed to that same kind of lifestyle. Uh, I wasn't sure. And I never had planned on making it a career when I first came in, Thought I would do like my six years or your initial commitment. 
And then I would get out and do some other kind of federal work, but it was actually after my first or second deployment and, and with, with my spouse on there, we just decided like, this is a long-term plan is that, that we were going to do this. And I wanted to make a career. Um, some people like all the time out in the woods, you know, and learning, uh, I was actually there in the winter time. It was like three feet of snow and it was like negative 10 degrees outside. And you have to, and I learned how to, uh, shave wood on sticks and make a fire on top of snow. So you're like, so I'll have that skill forever <laughs> like, <laughs> that I know I can like make a fire anywhere because of like the few little things, in my backpack or something. So, uh, some people really like that aspect of it, like living out in the woods for a week and, uh, up in Washington, it just depends on what time of year you go. So it's, it's not all bad. And then you, you have a week that's, uh, a week or maybe just like four or five days or something. That's the water survival portion. Uh, so just different uh, techniques on being in a raft or learning how to use the different raft. A lot of it is just learning about all the emergency equipment that is on your aircraft. So it's for all kinds of people in different positions and different flat platforms. But, you know, you have radios and different gear and reflectors and uh, how to communicate all those kind of things. It's, it's teaching you a lot of those skills. So for the most part, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so it's not so bad. And you're there probably with people, like I was there with classmates that I had just been with at Tyndall and my roommate uh, there, we were just classmates at Tyndall and then we're there for the three weeks for survival school. So it's like, you'll have people around that you know or maybe in your same group. And like most things, uh, you're always in a group of people. And so one person's better than other people while you're walking around in the woods because you're in a group of like four people the whole time. So it's not horrendous. <laughs> You'll have war stories forever. <laughs> Thank you. If I could just ask a follow-up question. Yes, right? absolutely. Does it happen right after OTS and like between OTS and tech school or is it after tech school and before first deployments? It will be, yes, they won't send you after OTS. It's, it's pretty much 99% of the time after uh, the training at Tyndall. So they want to make sure that you can get through all of that initial training before, because of course, sending people to, uh, it's, it's expensive. So it's, whether they send you from Tyndall and you come back before you PCS somewhere, or you go to like Tinker or Robbins and then go, um, is that doesn't really matter, but it's 99% of the time, it's somewhere in between there. It's gonna be between Tyndall and your next location. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Another question that came through, it says you mentioned that you could deploy within the first year. Is that after the first couple of years of studying or first year out of OTS? Kind of no, I meant question. like as in your first year at being in an operations squadron. So at that point, um, you've maybe, this of course is post OTS, post Tyndall, and then post whatever follow on training, depending on whether you went to Tinker or, um, uh, Robbins or Kadena or Alaska or something like that. And then went through that next year of training, then went to an operations squadron, then had a few months of integration there and probably one exercise of your career or crew or something, then you would have it. So not something you're going to see for like a couple of years after your, after OTS. Most likely. And then how will the air battle management role change in the near future, given the rise of AI? So uh, I'm not sure if it's directly related to like uh, AI kind of things, but as far as like technological advancements kind of thing, uh, that is definitely happening in the air battle manager career field, which, which I thought uh, makes it even more exciting that it's, um, has that opportunity and a lot more room for growth and change than just uh, you know, being in a pilot's position that's kind of you know, more static. So even just on the E3, we've significantly changed uh, some of the consoles and what we used to, like, at least when I first went, our controlling system was basically what had been around in like the 80s and 90s with like a DOS style input, which nobody would even understand, uh, uh, but now has like a normal, like Microsoft based uh, screens kind of in control systems. Now ground control units are way more advanced and um, there are systems that they can use, but the airborne platforms, of course, cause it's so much more expensive, took a lot more time to update. But now we have that on all, uh, 
not quite all the jets because it's not all the locations, but at Tinker anyway, that's changed. It's now like the E3 G instead of the E3 B and C that they used to have. And now that's changed other things. So as of they just back in uh, September, there was articles around about having like this new uh, air crew construct because they have these more advanced systems where it doesn't take so much specialty and months and months of time just to be like an electronic combat officer or to be the officer that does the surveillance team kind of thing. Um, the systems are more intuitive and easier to use that you can interchange those positions a lot more. So now they have uh, just like one ABM cr uh, crew position where, and then you can just sit different positions and different uh, on that crew. So there's more details of that you would know if you went there, but it's just that the technology and its capabilities has changed even the crew construct within inside the back of the aircraft. So there'll be more, more things like that, I think, uh, in the future and its use between CRCs uh, and its locations and then what we can do with different radar sites. So um, not necessarily, uh, I will say slightly artificial intelligence on there. If people read a lot of articles out there because it's like cheapest stuff of the Air Force was like big thing with like JADC2, which is basically just a platform set, but it's a way of like integrating all different forms of communication. So things are coming from different radar sites and even army platforms and other things and all coming into these different types of uh, there's different ways to get that information. JADC2 is just the way of uh, just of a platform of it that uses different types of AI to filter large amounts of information that's coming in from all these different locations. And then somebody maybe at a NORAD location can see, uh, and we use some of these different systems, even at uh, CONAR at First Air Force where I'm at, because we deal with anything that's related to home de homeland defense and to support and all the fighters that are related to that. So we we are using, since we have to report to Nora Northcom on a regular basis on all of that, uh, using some of these newer JAT C2s and it is using AI and in information filtering kind of. So uh, you can see you can see that in much more interesting ways if you were in and then you can get all the classified versions of it. So if that interests you, again, there's all kinds of little different aspects of the career field that you can be like, oh, this is this is my area. I really like this kind of stuff. So okay, and the last question that we have here, it's there's no dumb question. However, what is the cutoff age to apply as an air battle manager? So that is one of our like a recruiting question. Mm -hmm. uh, the minimum age is a less than 40 years old you have to be in order to apply. Oh, so it's gone those. up a lot. It was yeah. like 28 when I was applying. Yeah, it's less than 40 now. And for, for active duty, is that correct? You could be yes. like 35 and apply for active duty. Yes, wow, we're really getting people now. That used to only be like in the guard world. We would see people at the schoolhouse sometimes come through that were like later 30s or something, but it was because they're in yeah. the guard. guard. I, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So it's like I actually came in, I had about a five year gap in between undergraduate. I had graduated uh, from college when I was like about 21. I didn't come into the Air Force when I was until I was about 25, 26, um, and kind of had like another career in there, mostly because it was taking so long. They only had one board a year and then that mm -hmm. one was canceled. So, but uh, so it's not, so I didn't come in until I was like 25, 26. And if somebody came in and they were a 30 or older, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There's actually some advantages as an officer if you have some work experience or some kind of like outside uh it just gives a different perspective from people that have only been in the military their whole lives it's just a good balance in a workspace mm -hmm. the only age that is different um, of all the rating fields is going to be in aircraft pilot um, mm -hmm. the max age is they have to be 33 by the time that they join so that's the only exception even remote pilot aircraft they have to be less than 40 to apply mm -hmm. to join well, excellent. Great questions, everyone.